my name is Mario Lourdes. I'm the safety coordinator for Epic Personnel Partners, and this is an EPJ class. An EPJ is an electric pallet jack. The one behind me here is a single. The reason it's called a single is because it has a single deep, long tail. Uh, we also have electric pallet jacks that are double, and the way to identify those is the tail is double the size and length. Uh, during the first part of the EPJ class, it's important that you bring up the fact that at the beginning of every time you go to sign one of these pieces of equipment out, you are to fill out a safety checklist, an inspection sheet. And every single day you have to do this and you are held accountable to make sure that this is performed every day before checking out your equipment. When you go down the list for the appropriate day that you are here, it will tell you damaged, bent, dented, leaks, brakes, hydraulics. So it's as simple as walking around your electric pallet jack and making sure that there's nothing visu visually damaging on the equipment. So this is the electric pallet jack. You have your platform here, the main body. You have your battery cables here. You always check that. You have your main battery here. On each side of the battery, you have these battery plates that are removable. You always want to make sure that the battery plates are in. There's a there's the same one on the other side, and this prevents that big battery from falling out. Something you always have to look at. The top rack here is loose. Make sure that that is on appropriately. Your back rack is the big metal rack on the back. This is what is going to stop the product from actually collapsing onto you. So you always want to make sure that that is sturdy and on there pretty good. No welding issues. Then you have to look at the forks. Make sure you inspect your tires, your forks. There's no dents, no dings, no chips missing from your tires, and you'll know that those are okay. When you come around to the corner, this is called your control arm with the throat. And basically, you want to bring it all the way down and make sure you feel that flex as it comes up. And we'll get back into why that's important later. You have your throttles here, and to turn it on, you have your on and off switch, which we switch to on. You're gonna let it cycle. The lights are gonna go up, they're gonna go back down, and then once you hear that metallic click, you know that everything is okay. You're gonna to wanna to inspect your forks and make sure they go up and down. That's all the way up. We always make sure that when we're traveling on this piece of equipment, we never travel with the forks all the way up. This makes it more susceptible to run things over, and more importantly, if you, if you take a turn too fast, you could possibly dump the load that you're hauling. So we never ride around with it that high, but we want to make sure that everything's functional. We lower the forks all the way. No issues, you don't hear any weird noises, no problems, everything's good. When we're traveling from A to B, your fork should only be about an inch or two off the ground. So when you go up to your equipment and you want to turn it on for the first time you're approaching it, there's only one switch with a green and a red dot. You switch that switch to up and you're going to see everything light up. Once it lights up, you give it a second for the lights to turn off and then they're going to turn back on. If it's quiet enough, you'll be able to hear a metallic click. When you hear that click, you know that everything's okay. The first thing that I want to point out is just like a dashboard on a car, you have check engine lights. Whether it looks like a little wrench or a battery symbol, if you see any of those illuminated on your dash, you do not want to check out that piece of equipment. You want to bring that to the cage attendant um, and let him know that, that that's happening with that piece of equipment. You also have an up, down, left, and right crosshair that are orange buttons on these pieces of equipment. We are never to touch those. Those adjust speed and other altercations on the vehicle that we are not authorized to be messing with. So that's something that's off limits to everybody. Um, on the top part of your handle here, this is your handle that's attached to the EPJ and then this is actually your control neck. So you have the same buttons that are here on here, okay? We have our forks up, we have our forks down. Rabbit speed, like we spoke about before, is when you're holding the throttle all the way and you click that rabbit, it'll go a hair faster than maximum speed. It will automatically disengage the rabbit as soon as you let go of the, of the clutch. What happens here is you have the same exact buttons on the control arm that you have there. So you have your forks up, you have your forks down, and you also have a horn. The reason that these buttons are here is because this piece of equipment was originally designed to be walked. Walking an EPJ is doing this. At no point in time during 
any assignment within this facility are you authorized to walk an EPJ. We do not utilize this piece of equipment like this here. So you will never be using this, this part of the equipment unless you're just using the throttle. Um, as far as the throttle goes, just like the gas in your car, you want to ease onto it. It's not something you want to get in and just automatically wrench on. It's something that you want to ease gently onto until you find your comfortability with your speed. Now we're going to go over mounting the EPJ and the three forms of stopping. Okay, so when you go up to this piece of equipment, and at all times when you are riding or mounting this piece of equipment, you are to have four points of contact at all times. Um, four points of contact is extremely simple based on what side of the equipment you like to ride on. Step one, one point. Two points, three, and four. I have four solid points of contact on this piece of equipment, and this is the standard in riding the EPJ at all times. No one should be riding the equipment completely turned around without three points of contact, without four points of contact. The standard is like so. You want a nice, comfortable square shoulder base. You want a slight bend in your knees. And keep in mind that on both sides, you have these knee pads that are a little squishy. So what happens is dig one of your knees into the knee pad and make sure you have a good stance on this piece of equipment and good balance. What we're gonna go over is stopping. There are two forms of emergency stopping and the way that we stop all the time. So, the way that we stop all the time is called plugging. Plugging is a method at which when you turn the throttle forward and you're driving in one direction, you let go of the throttle and turn it in the opposite direction just long enough to bring the equipment to a stop. This is something that the this is something that the student in your class is going to have to feel out for themselves and you're really going to have to monitor their wrists and the motion that they're using if they're understanding the controls. So in order to plug, I'm going to back up a little bit. Before moving forward, always utilize your horns. And basically you want them to move knuckles forward. We'll bring them in the forward direction. You let go, bring it back slightly, and come to a complete stop. If you do it in the opposite direction, you look in the direction of travel. Again, let go, turn it in the opposite direction, and come to a stop. This is called plugging. You want to make sure that the student understands how to plug properly. This isn't something you want to speed through. You want to make sure they completely grasp the concept. Now, the two ways for emergency stop. An emergency stop would occur if someone stepped out from behind product, another vehicle cut in front of you, and it's an emergency, you have to come to a complete stop and you do not have the time to plug. The first way to emergency stop is you allow the throat to go all the way up. The second way is all the way down. In both of these, in both of these positions, even moving the throttle, the equipment will not move because the emergency brake is now engaged. I will show you what the emergency brake looks like. When utilized correctly, just go straight down, hang on, and drop your weight. I like to teach in the classes to go down. Majority of the times, when you let the throat come up, it's throwing you slightly off balance. Where if you go down, you're automatically dropping your weight, and in my opinion, it's a little safer for the rider. So, this next portion of the class, we're gonna go over turning and actually riding on the equipment. First and foremost, everywhere inside the facility is treated just like the rules of the road. So just like you were operating a vehicle outside of the facility, you were held to the same standards inside the facility. Every aisle within the facility on the end caps has stop signs, yield signs, pedestrian walkways, and all pedestrians have the right of way no matter what. So during these courses, you wanna make sure that you understand and your students understand that you will be written up if you do not follow the rules of the road inside the facility. LP and certain people in here will write you citations if you're not following the standard. And the standards are important because it keeps you as a rider safe and it keeps, it keeps the rest of our employees around us safe. So remember, you always mount the EPJ with four points of contact. And when you mount it, you wanna be ready to drive. So once we're on here, you get a good comfortable stance and now I'm ready to go. The appropriate direction of travel is this way. We never, ever, ever travel forks forward. The only time we travel forks forward 
is to pick up or drop off, and it should only be a couple feet. At no point do we travel from A to B, forks forward. So, when you go to turn in a single direction, so if I'm gonna turn away from me, okay, a lot of, a lot of students with zero experience will get on this piece of equipment and naturally assume that you have to muscle the arm in order to move it. If you try to do that for eight hours, it's really gonna bother your arm. It's, it's very difficult to do especially when you're not moving. So what we try to encourage riders to do is to use your hips. Your hips is a lot less effort and a lot stronger than if you were trying to control it with your arm. This will give you more control over the vehicle and all. So if I wanted to turn away from me, the only thing I would have to do is get a farther stance across the platform and swing my hip into the arm. When I swing my hip into the arm, I'm still having full control, I still have my four points of contact, and it's making this effortless for me to be able to turn away and leave. Now, if I wanted to turn the opposite direction, the same exact way as last time, only this time I can't use my hip. So the only thing you would need to do is you grab, you grab your control arm, you're gonna take a step back to the other side of the platform, because remember, I want to take a turn over my right shoulder. So you make sure to utilize your horn always so people know that you're in motion. I will pull the arm to my waist. I look over my right shoulder to make sure it's clear. And I slowly go into my turn. A lot of people get uncomfortable with this or have a hard time with this because they do not move around the platform. Like I said at the beginning, they try to control it all with their arm and it's very difficult. So be cognizant when you're giving these classes to be able to identify who's using the proper body motions while turning this piece of equipment. You wanna use your hip for the farther turns and you wanna make sure you're pulling it to your waist on the other turns. Because if you're not, let's say we get a rider who's a little shorter or a little taller, they emphasize and try to bring it down Remember that we are engaging the emergency brake when you're doing that. This piece of equipment, in order for it to, to, to move, you're gonna have to keep it at waist level with square shoulders during the entire course. So after touching all those points of the EPJ, this is everything that is imperative that you have to be certifying our potential employees on, or our future employees on. Every single class should be conducted covering everything that I just covered. At this point in time in the course, after explaining everything, the proper forms of turning, stopping, and how to check out the equipment and how to properly utilize it, um, you will then break off and create in a safe place, somewhere that is not too cluttered, somewhere that is not too compact during the day. You wanna make sure there's plenty of space, plenty of room to be able to give the certification class. I would always recommend grabbing orange cones, training cones, or plastic pallets. Um, grab plastic pallets, you can set up a course and make them do laps counterclockwise, clockwise, figure eights um, in the forward direction, in the backward direction. You want to make sure they understand stopping, plugging, and most importantly all the safety, safety rules alongside with the electric pallet jack and driving it within the facility. Um, and then make sure that we always conclude our summaries and that we upload all notes into Aviante and have a great day.